So, uh, morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've been uh, dabbling with Erlang for you know, well over 20 years now. And if you go back to, well, the mid-90s and you, know, you wanted to work with Erlang, you had one potential employer you could go to, and that was Ericsson. And so, you know, there I was, you know, straight out of university. Um, it was that stage in my life where, you know, you thought you knew absolutely everything uh, until you learned something new, and, and then you knew absolutely everything again. And, uh, and there I was, so I started off at Ericsson, you know, passionate about Erlang, wanted to work with Erlang, and obviously, you know, what do they do? They do uh, very, very large-scale, well, telecom infrastructure projects. So these are projects which have such a large life cycle that you, you, you basically never get to see your code go into production. So if you take it, I mean, 1996, I was working on um, Ericsson's ADSL system, so Ericsson's broadband system. You know, broadband, you know, got, they started rolling broadband out in you know, 2000, 2001. I had colleagues working on you know, GPRS which eventually became 3G, which eventually became 4G LTE. And even there, you know, once you had committed your code uh, to ClearCase, and yes, there was a time where ClearCase was, uh, was hip and trendy and you know, cutting edge, believe it or not, uh, that was it. You, know, you maybe got a bug report back from your testing department, but uh, and, you, know, you fixed it and you, know, you, 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 you didn't commit your code, you checked it in. And, uh, and that was it. Uh, you actually never got to experience a, a life cycle, in, you know, you, 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 everything in production. But w one of the things which I didn't quite understand you know, when I was at Ericsson is that we were given, and these were large projects, projects with 50 you know, to up to 100 developers. We were given very strict guidelines we had to follow. And we did as we were told, we, you know, we followed these guidelines. And it wasn't until about a decade later, so 2003, 2004, when I was actually on call 24-7 supporting a system. And, and at that point, that's when I got my aha moment as to why you know, we were being given these guidelines, which we had to follow. Now, a quick you know, show of hands here. How many of you have had to wake up in the middle of the night to you know, handle an outage? So quite a few. No? I've been on call 24/7. I did not raise my hand, and the reason, well, I'm gonna, well, and the reason is, you know, I applied in this system. It was a system I had written myself. I applied, you know, what we had learned at Ericsson um, yeah, when working, and it was a large-scale messaging system, which I will refer to as we go along. Now, you all know, well, telecoms. You know, th there's one thing which you can be sure about, and it's when you pick up that phone you'll hear the tutu on the other end. It's almost certain. And if it doesn't, you know, back then, you know, we, know, we knew that you know, it would make the front pages of the newspapers. It was in the law, you know, the legislation stated that your telecom system, your telecom infrastructure could not go down. Even though you know, there was a hurricane or a natural catastrophe, you still had to be able to dial the emergency services. It was the law. And secondly, you know, there, was, you know, there were massive penalties uh, inflicted on the infrastructure providers in case there was an outage where you know, they could prove that the outage was as a result of a fault of the infrastructure provider. So massive penalties. And that meant that you actually shipped code which you know, gave you five nines availability. You know, five nines is about five and a half minutes of downtime per year, and that includes all software maintenance. And you know, what applied back then still applies pretty much today. Um, no matter if you're dealing with online gaming, you know, financial systems, e-commerce sites, or, or, or messaging solutions. You know, the only difference is that the, the newspapers have you know, been replaced by your users, angry users on social media. And the key you know, to achieving your, your five nines availability is making sure that you have a system with no single points of failure. Do we have any New Yorkers here? No New Yorkers. Does anyone recognize this building? What, what is it? Uh, I read the article that it was, it was, it was like a secret white concession. Okay, it, it opposite. Uh, it became secret uh, more recently. So this is, um, this is uh, the old AT&T Long Lines building in Manhattan, uh, Lower Manhattan in New York. It's on 33 Thomas Street in Tribeca. Um, 
it is actually an example of brutalist architecture. It has no windows. It is kind of clad with uh, Swedish granite. And it's actually built to withstand a nuclear fallout. And what did they put in this building? Phone switches. It opened in 1974 to house AT&T's phone switches. You know, at the time, 1974, switches were mechanical. You needed a lot of space. And the basement of this building has a tank, a petrol tank, which will power the generators for two weeks after an electricity failure. So you can go in and cut the power lines to this building for two weeks, you know, past, you know, uh, for two weeks after you cutting the power lines, it will still continue switching your phone calls. And, you know, it was actually the only building after 9-11 south of uh, Canal Street which was still fully functional. So even despite, you know, you had no water supplies, you had no, um, you had no electricity, you could still dial the emergency services assuming you got through. And I think the bottom line here is, you know, you need, you know, to, to, to have a system which is fully resilient, which never fails and never stops, you need at least two of everything. You know, in this particular example, well, you know, you need, you know, two power supplies, redundant power supplies, but you also need redundant hardware. Uh, not only redundant hardware, you need redundant networks. Uh, you need, um, you, you need, you know, if you're using cloud providers, you need to basically deploy in, uh, in um, heterogeneous cloud. I mean, just look at what happened at Amazon earlier this week. And even there, you know, not always, a single point of failure is not always enough. Um, there was a phone switch which had been switching the international trunks for, of, um, a, for a mar major telco in a city of 8 million inhabitants. And this switch had been there running for three years without anyone having to touch it. So the software was so solid that in the three years it was running, they never did any upgrades and they never had to reboot the system. So after three years, and it was all Erlang running in the back end, and after three years, you know, Ericsson went to this customer and said, listen, we're aware that you've not had any issues, but we need to upgrade because we're not maintaining and supporting this code anymore. And so what they did is, you know, it was free releases they had to upgrade. So instead of doing a live upgrade, which they usually do, they said, let's just reboot one node. You know, we will fail over the traffic on the standby node. And we reboot one node, bring it up to the latest release, then we fail the traffic back to this new node and get, yeah, and upgrade the, the, the standby node. And so they went in, they did the upgrade on one node, they tried to reboot it, and the system wouldn't start. You know, the switch, that particular board would not swap, start at all. And so all of a sudden they panicked and decided to upgrade the standby node, which had become the primary node. So taking it down, say it takes two minutes to reboot, so for two minutes, uh, users we won't be able to make any international calls, we can live with that, you know, it, it was in the middle of the night, it was 2 a.m., hopefully no one's gonna notice. And they went in on the standby node, which had become the primary, they tried to, they upgraded the software, and they tried to reboot everything, and once again, that node wouldn't even start up. And so for one week, they tried to figure out what was going wrong. And this was a foreign country far, far away. Uh, a colleague of mine had to end up flying to this country, smuggling boards in his jacket. He actually had them in his jacket walking through customs. Was, had they FedExed them or shipped them, they would have been stuck for cus in customs for weeks. You know, putting in the new board, you know, getting the switch up and running again. And in the post-mortem analysis they did, they went in and you know, they took apart this hardware and realized that the boot sector of the hard drive is the external sector. These are hermetic uh, hermetically sealed hard drives. And the fact that the system had not rebooted for three years meant that the thin layer of dust had collected on the external boot sectors of the hard disk. And so three years later, when they decided to access that sector, the head you know, just got stuck on this thin layer of dust. So, I mean, 
th this story is there to remind you that you know, it's not always about the software and you know, no single points of failure are not often enough. But you know, in this talk, I will actually be focusing on the software itself. And if you look at various studies you've got out there, you know, they pretty much all point to the same thing, that you know, somewhere between 60 to 80%, depending on who you believe, of your actual cost is going to be maintenance. So of, of the whole software life cycle is going to be ma maintenance. And my argument here today is that you know, this, the total amount here can be reduced drastically uh, if you spend more time on your requirement specification design and coding phases looking at monitoring, looking at the actual visibility you have in your system. And remember, you know, I used to write the code, I used to throw it over, you know, commit it to clear case, and not think about monitoring. And I think most developers think and reason that way because they do not, you know, they're not the ones be, who be, you know, get woken up in the middle of the night to clean up the mess they've created. Um, and it, often, you know, if you are, you make sure that you, know, you learn and you make sure that you are, you're, you're not the one who has to deal with it. And, you know, but by investing more in monitoring, what you do is you get the visibility into what's going on in the system. Uh, you collect a lot of information and you get to act on this information. And you use this information for two reasons. You know, preemptive support. So you try to detect failure. You try to detect issues uh, before they escalate and cause an outage. And secondly, you, know, you will have outages. You will have issues. It's software you're dealing with. But the second part is actually trying to figure out when something went wrong, why it went wrong, and then put in the early warning signs and the fixes to actually make sure it never happens again. So what we tend to call post-mortem debugging. And this is the secret sauce to achieving five nines availability. It's monitoring and you know, to combine with no single points of failure. Now, when I talk about monitoring, there are three things which you need to do and you need to think about. The first one is metrics. So, you know, metrics are usually obtained by, by, by polling um, a particular value at any point in time. So, um, let's take, you know, memory, for example. You might go in and poll how much memory is the Beam virtual machine using at this point in time. How many users are, how many active sessions, how many active user sessions do we currently have in our system? Or you know, another value is you know, how many login attempts failed in the last hour. You know, maybe you might be trying to find, uh, um, you know, try, try, try to discover you know, someone trying to hack into your, your email account has been known to happen. And you want to see you know, the failed attempts at, you know, the failed login attempts right there. The second, um, you know, the second, um, the, not the second, met, not the metric, but the, the second, you know, amount, the, blah, 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 sorry. The second data you want to look at is logins, logs. So logs is an entry in a file or a database that records an event or a state change uh, in your environment. So it could be, once again, it could be a user logging on um, and you actually log what this user was and if it was successful or if it failed, it could be just logging a, an operator typing something in the console. So first or second line support, typing something in the console at two in the morning. And as a result of typing this something in two in the morning causes an outage. You know, when you're investigating the outage, you might want to know, you know, exactly what happened in the lead up to the outage. It could be logging a network partition, networking issues. So you know, it's a mixture of, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of, yeah, uh, kind of system events and events in your business logic. And thirdly, and this is something I've rarely seen used outside of the telco space, it's alarms. Now, alarms are a subset of logs which have a state associated with it. And the state means that you can actually raise an alarm when you're in danger of something happening and you can clear it when you're no longer in danger. So, and the clearing usually happens as a result of a resolution. So resolution could either be manual, triggered manually, or automated. So let's take, uh, you've got your system, and all of a sudden, you get an 80% disk full alarm. So you start running the risk of running out of, hard, hard, uh, run, running out of disk space. So by raising an alarm, you'll alert someone in your DevOps team 
and remind them that it's time to go in and do some you know, housekeeping. Go in and delete some, you know, delete your temporary files and delete logs you no longer need. And another type of alarm is usually triggered by uh, thresholds. So think of you hitting, uh, you know, assume your system allows you to have a maximum of 10,000 users simultaneously connected, and you know that if you go beyond this 10,000 users, they're going to have a much worse experience. They're, they're going to have a degradation of uh, their experience. Yeah, the latency is going to go up, so their whole user experience will, will go down. So what you do, well, let's stop other users from coming into the system. Or let's raise an alarm if we get hit 10,000. We allow other users to keep on coming into the system, but let's, let's, go, in and, um, let's go in and push uh, let, let's go in and deploy more hardware. Let's go in and deploy new instances which can handle this, this, this extra load. So you, know, you monitor a counter, so you monitor a, a metric, which is the number of logged in users, and if you hit a certain threshold, you go in and you trigger an action which could be automated or manual. And you know, when we look at these type of metrics, logs and alarms, there are two types which we need to think about. One are the system metrics, so the metrics which are related to the system itself. So this could be, uh, once again, memory. It could be operating system or networking specific metrics. Or they could be business metrics. So business metrics you know, relate to your specific application. So it could be the number of users logged on. It could be the number of you know, failed credit card transactions. It could be the number of lo failed logged in attempts and so on. It could be the length of a, a particular session as well. And there are different types of users you know, who, who will use you know, these, these two different types of metrics. I'll give you a few examples. Um, I think you know, one of the metrics you know, to actually monitor is memory utilization. And we're seeing you know, a lot of, well, how, how many of you in who have live system actually monitor your memory utilization? It's quite a few. Do you monitor just the total memory utilization of the beam? Or do you monitor the individual memory types? Total memory, yeah. You all monitor total memory, which is great because uh, it, it's better than nothing. It's a bit similar to documentation. Yeah. Little documentation is better than nothing. But um, you know, we, don't, we monitor absolutely everything. So we will monitor, in this particular case, you know, how much memory is the atom table using? How much memory is the airline term storage using? How much memory is your binary heap using? How much process memory is being used you know, by all of your processes? How much memory is actually your, we, we monitor in how much memory the code is actually using and the system memory, system memory as well. So we actually know if there's a memory leakage exactly where and what has caused this memory leakage. If we look at this graph, you see a little bump right here and what's bumping up, you, you probably can't read it, it's, it's, it's a little bump here, which then gets reflected up there. The, to the top line is the total memory usage, which is what you monitor. Now, you go in and you see that little bump there, you wouldn't have a clue over what caused it. But by looking down here, we see that it's the code memory, which bumps up, and the system memory. What this means is that on the 5th of November, at night, we did a software upgrade, we loaded new modules into the system, and then we monitored the system to ensure it was stable. And you know, closer to midnight, we then went in and made the system permanent. That means we purged all the old versions of the module and made the system yeah, run on the latest versions. Now, what was interesting here is that you know, within you know, three, four days, the amount of process memory increased by about 50%. And so, you know, why, why is that happening? You know, is this increase, is this increase going to continue until we run out of memory? Could it be that we're maybe not, we, we might have to trigger a garbage collection of the process, a forced garbage collection of the process? So if you remember, your process will only garbage collect when they need to access, when they need the memory. So there will be cases where they're, they're sitting on a lot of memory which they actually don't need and you might want to go in and force a garbage collection. Could it be that we've got many processes? So every user session could be a new process. So you know, could that be the reason why, you know, wh why the memory is increasing? So then you, what you then do is you go in and look at the number of processes which are there. Go in and look at how often the garbage collection is triggered. And you know, these are also metrics you can go in and look at. 
And here's another example. And what this, what this example here measures is the total message queue length of all the processes taken at regular polls. So taken um, on average, uh, taken I think about once a minute. So once a minute, you know, we make, take the sum of all of the message queues of all of the processes. And we found this you know, when we were stress testing a system which caused a crash. So we were trying to regenerate an error and we, ma we managed to regenerate it and the system had run out of memory and if the system runs out of memory, well, you tend to get a, a massive crash dump, which you know, sometimes can be gigabytes large. So you can have a lot of data to look through, uh, not recommended. Other cases, uh, you don't get the crash dump because you might have a script in the background which tries to restart your airline, your Beam virtual machine, and whilst the Beam virtual machine is writing the crash dump, the heart script says, no, 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 we need to restart the system as quickly as possible. Oh, beam is hanging. So it goes in and unconditionally terminates the beam you know, to then be able to go in and restart it. And what the beam is actually doing is it's trying to flush a massive crash dump to file and fails at doing so. So you know, you'll get your crash dump, which is zero bytes long. So you don't get the information you're looking for. And so in, in this particular example, you know, we ran out of memory. We saw that the process memory was spiking. So as a result of the process memory spiking, the first thing we did was let's look at the message queues. And we saw that right in the run up to the crash, we had an over 154,000 messages in the process queue. Node crashed, it was automatically restarted by script. And you know, we had a run up right there, which you know, went, you know, queue which went back up to about 40,000. Probably as a result of the recovery, it took a few hours and after a few hours, it be, it's, the system stabilized itself again, and you know, the message queue became, you know, got to the, to the level it was supposed to get to. Are you following me here? Yeah. So these are all things which, yeah, w which you, know, you need to keep in mind and monitor. Now, th there are several different types of, um, of counters. So you've got the counters which usually allow you to increment and decrement a value. You've got gauges where you actually go in and pull a value at a particular point in time. You've got histograms, which are readings over time. So uh, you're looking at you know, what is your latency, you know, what, is, what, what, what is your throughput in requests per second, per minute, per hour, or per day. And finally, you've got spirals, which is a polling over a particular time window. So you know, how many logins did I have in the last hour, and which then moves as your, yeah, as, as your timeline moves. Now, going in and investigating this crash, we started looking at you know, what caused this massive message queue in the run-up to the crash. And we went in and found, you know, we went in and found that you know, right, after, right after the crash, so what, 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 what I'm talking about here is you know, th this message queue right here. What happened right after the crash on a, on a particular node, on one of, the, one of the four nodes we were monitoring, now this this example comes from Mongoose IM, which is an instant messaging server. And this was actually some of the live data. We saw that after the crash, the message queue on one of the servers was up at around 4,000 requests, 4,000 messages. So it was a really long message queue. And the actual recovery and the restart was really, really slow. And you know, it took four, four hours to actually recover from the backlog of you know, messages you know, after the crash. And this backlog right here was about half a million users, which you know, because of the node crash had been kicked off this instant messaging system. You know, the socket connections had been terminated, so upon setting up the socket connections again, you know, we had, they had to go through the whole login, uh, the, the whole login um, performance. And it, took, you know, it took a long time. It was a really slow recovery after the crash. And just to make sure that you know, there wasn't any bottleneck in the system, we went in, every login usually entails an Amnesia transaction, uh, which is a very expensive operation. And we saw down here that the total number of ongoing, simultaneous ongoing transactions was not spiking, it was fairly low. And we saw it also here, this, was, this is what we call an incremental counter. It's a counter which only increments, which only goes up. 
which shows the total number of transactions happening in the system. And we saw, see that you know, after about four hours, we hit about half a million transactions, if you notice right there. And that meant you know, half a million users are now signed, lo signed, no, logged on again and were active. And so, so this is the level of visibility you usually need when you're trying to figure out what's gone wrong and what's caused an issue. And I'll come back to counters you know, a little bit later. So alongside counters, you know, another critical tool to actually figure out what's gone wrong is logs. And a log entry will usually reflect a system event in, in the Erlang virtual machine or your network or your operating system. And it could also be a, an event which triggers a state change in your business logic. So it could be a user once again logging on, logging off, uh, being denied access to the system. And you tend to you know, either log, you know, place your logs in append-only files, uh, wraparound files, or wraparound logs, or an entry in a time series database. And here is an example, you know, which you know, I think you also have in Elixir, which is you know, the SASL logs, the System Architecture Support Library. As soon as something goes wrong in a process, it logs an error report, and the error report contains things, you know, which, you know, what caused the exception, which, which contained the exception. And if the exception then results in a crash, the process itself, you know, and th this is from OTP behaviors, will create a crash report. Once again, which gets logged in your SASL logs, uh, if, if you've got your configuration flag set correctly. The supervisor picks up the fact that the process is terminated abnormally, and goes in and issues a supervisor report setting up. Oh, I've just trapped an exit signal from this process. It's crashed. These are the reasons. This is when I started it. You know, and and you know, th this is all the data I know about it. And after which it goes in and restarts it. So you might not be aware of it, but you know, in your system, you actually will have logs you know, just by setting a few configuration files, which tell you every time one of your OTP behaviors terminates abnormally. Now, it's not good enough to have these logs. You need to be able to react on them. We had a customer who had, you know, when we went in and did a site audit, who had about 30, 40 services all implemented on the beam. And they had a, a total of about 200 Erlang nodes running, so 200 nodes, you know, 200 VMs out there running. And the only way for them to realize that the process had crashed and then been restarted was to log onto the machine log onto the Erlang shell, start the report browser in the shell, and find these crash reports. So obviously you're asking me, oh, have you had any issues? Have you had any problems? And I say, oh no, everything's working fine. But somewhere, some users were, you know, were, were getting back an error you know, when the process crashed and had to retry. So it was a very minute sub sub subset, but it was still happening, and they weren't aware of it. You know, your logs need to be analyzed, so always go in, aggregate them, consolidate them. You know, if you have crash reports, you know, push them off to, to, you know, to Logly or Logstash or you know, whatever system it is you know, you're using to aggregate uh, your logs. Now, once again, just like with logs, there are two different types of logs. You've got your system logs, and you've got logs which pertain to your business metrics. And especially if you've got a, a mission critical system which deals with money uh, or you know, deals with, you know, with something, with money, financial transactions. It deals with something which requires an audit trail, which requires billing. You need to put yourselves in place an audit trail describing what happens. And there was one time when uh, you know, the system I was supporting, um, which never woke me up, I receive an email from support saying, oh, this is a very, very angry user. Uh, they had subscribed to a premium service where you know, they'd be told that their football, you know, they'd have their football scores text, so soccer uh, here in America, their soccer scores texted to, to them. Uh, and you know, they claimed they only received you know, the soccer scores after the match. And uh, so, you know, this system you know, I, I was managing had about a million SMS, which I was supporting, had about a million SMSs going through it every day. 
So a million SMSs, this is one user complaining, where is my text? So, okay, what's his number? Uh, and first thing, when the system, and, you know, when the requests enter the system, we logged it. We logged the time, we had the timestamp, we logged the phone number, we phone logged uh, the text, which had to be sent to the user, it was encrypted. So you know, we couldn't read it, but we lo it was logged. And we also logged a unique identifier for that particular request. Uh, and that unique identifier then followed that request throughout the whole system. So I found three texts which had to be sent, which were sent to this user. And looking at the timestamp, you know, you could guess it was first goal, second goal, final score. So I took I took the, the, the unique identifier of the first request, which is generated by your system, and I used it to, you know, to look at all the logical checks we did on this user. Is this user, yeah, was this user, um, was this user uh, a prepay or a postpay uh, a, a user? So are they paying in advance? If that's the case, 90% of all your premium rate texts you know, to Prepay to, to, to prepay users fail because they don't have enough credit on their account. And so no, it was a postpay, okay. He was allowed to receive premium rate SMSs and his account wasn't blocked, it was still active. So all of this was logged in the second log. So I then took that unique identifier and looked at where we sent that request to the SMSC. So we sent it off to the network. And the network returned a unique identifier back, which is, okay, this is the identifier I, you, know, you can use to identify this particular text. I took that identifier and I then looked at the logs for the delivery reports. And in there, I immediately found a delivery report which said handset detached. That means it was either turned off or it was out of coverage. The retry was every 30 minutes, so every 30 minutes, I got a, uh, retry, a, 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 a retry failed because the handset was still detached until after the match where all of the free SMSs were delivered in quick succession you know, when the handset became available again. Took me a minute, a minute and a half to go in and just prove my innocence. L literally, can you imagine had you not had these logs you would have gone through the code, you would have gone through crash reports. You know, forget accessing the SMSCs you know, or you know, any of the network logs because you know, that's another department. We don't speak to them. They don't speak to us. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, you know, it wouldn't have happened, but we had that level of granularity and visibility and we needed to have it because we charge for these texts. And if a user came in and said, hey, you've charged me for something, I wasn't the one, you needed to quickly show that you know, e you know, either admit guilt or, or prove your innocence. So uh, I ended up, you know, formulating a, I'm not a sports, big sports fan, my fan, so I ended up formulating a reply back to this friend of mine who was, yeah, had sent a report, report request saying, okay, you know, you know, with the logs showing, okay, nope, listen, you know, you've got to tell this user to either keep his phone on or, uh, or uh, you know, if his phone was on, move to a better network with better coverage. Um, because you know, he was, his handset was detached. And by the way, you could suggest he also gets a life. You know. um, how can he get so mad at, the tech, you know, at, at not receiving his football scores? Come on. Uh, to which I got back a reply, oh, this is the CEO of the company who was pissed off. And not only, I, a few years later, I also realized he was the chairman of that football club. <laughs> but um, so it's, it's good that you know, you've got always a li first line support which filters off your, 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 your sarcasm and bad comments. But th th this is just you know, the story. And what did we use? You know, we had, you know, it took a minute, a minute and a half, and you know, allowed me then to focus on, once again, preemptive support, on making sure that the system would not go down at night. And these logs, you know, the, the, these business metric, these logs are used, you know, not only for troubleshooting and, and improving your innocence, they're used for billing. We use them for billing. Uh, revenue assurance used them for audit logs, audits. So they checked you know, how much we believed we had you know, generated in revenue, and then they checked the logs on the SMSC side and made sure there was a match. And if that, you know, if that match was you know, deviated by half a percent, 
you know, it triggered a massive investigation. It's used by marketing. You know, marketing need to know, you know, how many texts are we sending? How long is the duration of a session? How many users are logging on? What features are they using? You know, what items in the shopping cart are they deleting? So, you know, it goes beyond actually ensuring that you get five nines. But, you know, I love, you know, Pat Helen's, uh, Helen's uh, you know, really wise words here that, you know, the truth is that the log, you know, the, the truth is the log, you know. The database is just a cache of a subset of the logs. And that's what you need to keep in mind when you, yeah, wh when you start doing your logs on a business level. And also, you know, keep separate files. You know, we've had, um, once again, people who've never had to wake up in the middle of the night to deal with it, you know, putting all of the logs in the same file. It will become a bottleneck, and it will become a mess to actually try and unfollow, especially if you've got millions of requests coming through. Now, the third is alarms, and you know, alarms are met when certain, you know, alarms are raised, you raise an alarm. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, when it comes to log, logs, you know, you've, got, you've, got logger in, uh, you've got logger in Elixir. Now, I'm not sure logger will withstand the ability to, you know, to, to, to create, you know, when we look at these high throughput systems, we often have to write our bespoke logging applications because you know, we need to cater for probably you know, 50, 60,000 log entries per second. You know, say each request, you know, there are 10,000 requests going through the system at any one time. Each request might maybe entail seven state changes, so you might want to do seven log entries. You're, you're looking at 70 to 100,000 log entries per second. And you know, logger, lager, you know, they won't handle this, this throughput this level of throughput. So most of the time, you know, we've had to handle, you know, do our own and go in and highly optimize them for the type of operating system we were running on, you know, for that particular file system or, you know, be it a database or whatnot. And the third, you know, critical thing, which once again, I, I mentioned it earlier and I'll say it again because it's important, I very rarely see it being used, is alarming. And alarms are raised when certain criteria are met. So, Whenever uh, you start running out of disk space, for example, you raise an alarm. And they're cleared when there's either automatic or manual intervention which happens. So you, know, you, you get an 80% disk full alarm, you could go in and trigger a script which will tar all your logs and bring it back down to under 80%. You could you know, trigger a script which does housekeeping. And then yeah, at 80%, you know, you have severities listed with your alarm. So an 80% disk full alarm might be considered minor. You know, it, it, it's don't wake up in the middle of the night, don't pull someone out, you know, from, you know, don't, don't page anyone out. But if it's during office hours, yeah, hey, someone should be looking at this. You then have uh, critical alarms. So then you have uh, a major alarm, sorry, major alarms. And that could hit when you, instead of 80% disk full, you'd each 90% disk full. And a major alarm might warrant you, you know, getting someone who's on call, you know, before they go to bed. So, you know, between you know, 7 a.m. and 10 p.m., send out, you know, your, your pager duty request and make sure that they go in and have a look and make sure that, you know, you won't run out of disk space. And then, you know, you'll, and, and at that point, you know, you could, as an example, you know, automate a script as well, which will go in and reduce you know, delete some of the logs, not just torrent, but actually delete them, and re you know, reduce the wraparound time for them. And then you know, you'll have critical alarms, which could be 95% you know, disk full, and they'll have another set different SLA, they'll have another set of actions. So that could be going in and uh, pulling, you know, actually waking someone out of bed, because you then get this five, you know, you, you actually get a, uh, you know, you, you'll get this, you, know, you, you have a risk of you know, the system running out of disk space and then crashing. And, you know, and that could be in the middle of the night. Now, there are two different types of alarms. There are state-based alarms. So they, that basically means that they originate from the VM itself, from the node itself. And it could be a pool of sockets as soon as, you know, towards a database. Assume you've got a pool of five sockets and three of them go down, you only have two sockets left. As soon as that happens, you might want to raise an alarm to alert the operator that you know, you're having connectivity problems with your database. And then as soon as those three you know, sockets are restored, you clear it immediately. So these are state-based alarms. Um, the ones, you know, the examples always used in telecoms is you open a cabinet door 
you might want to raise a minor alarm. Your, your fan, your ventilation stops working, uh, you want to raise a major alarm. Yeah, because you, you, you run the risk of overheating your switch. So, and the third is, yeah, and then the different type of alarm are threshold-based alarms. And I've seen threshold-based alarms being used, but that's usually, you know, they originally, usually originate from Nagios, who will go in and collect some metrics, and, you know, and you know, if you hit certain thresholds, either lower, with upper bounds or lower bounds, it will go in and generate these alarms. So take Amazon. If you have no purchases within the last minute, there's something wrong here. You know, even though the system might be still be up and running, you, know, you, you want to go in and yeah, have someone look at it because it's not normal even if it's in the middle of the night. Or you might have you know, um, you know, upper thresholds. So you know that a particular node will handle 100 users, raise an alarm as soon as you know, you've hit that threshold, deploy more hardware. And here are just some examples from the previous example, which I was showing you, where we actually go in and raise alarms whenever you know, process message queues become too large. And we were, this, this came from when we were trying to reproduce the error I was showing you earlier in, uh, in a controlled environment. And by stress testing all the logins, we actually realized that you know, a process actually ended up getting over a million messages in its pro message queue. And yeah, what was causing it? Um, well, one of the items was Misa transactions failing. And another alarm which was raised was that we'd hit, in the airline VM, the system limit. Now, there's a limited number of ports you can have, uh, processes, airline term storages, sockets. And they're default values, but you can override them when you start up the airline VM, when you start up the beam. And in this particular case, we had hit a system uh, limit, which was the ETS table count, where we had hit you know, 2053. And that meant every Minisa transaction goes in and creates a new table, a new ETS table, which it then deletes after. So what that meant is that at any one time, we had a maximum of 2,000 users being allowed to log on to the system at any one time. And logging on to the system in instant messaging is a really expensive operation. You need to authenticate them. You need to get the roster. You need to you know, tell everyone that they're online and that they're offline. And you need to you know, propagate the data to other nodes. And looking further, guess what? There was another alarm here, which was also major, which was basically telling us that we were running different versions of the MongoDB driver on separate nodes. So MongoDB wasn't our choice. It was, you know, the customer's always right. And our, 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 our mess up here was that we had done a manual deployment of the system. And in one of the four nodes, we had not upgraded the MongoDB driver. And that was literally slowing down on one of the nodes, the nodes which was causing problems, which then crashed, all of the, all of the requests. Uh, it, was a buggy Mongo, it was a buggy driver. We went in, we fixed it, and all of a sudden, you know, this is the arithmetic mean you know, of the number of requests coming in, and all of a sudden we see that driver, you know, the speed and the throughput of that particular driver coming back up to normal. So, you know, problem solved. Yeah. So, you know, moral of the story is, you know, that the route to five nines is, you know, five nines availability. So that's, you know, about five and a half minutes of downtime per year, including software upgrades, is to gather and analyze the information you receive. And you use it for two reasons. One is, you know, support automation. And support automation allows you to do something called preemptive support. Uh, you know, preemptive support means that as soon as you get early warnings about things which might happen, take action. And you need to automate that action. Uh, through scripts, you want to do end-to-end you know, -end monitoring of your system. So you want to have probes outside of your system as well, raising alarms. Uh, we got called out once, uh, and we went in and looked at the system. Hey, it's fully functional. It's working. 
and then we realized that there was no traffic going through it at all. And this was yeah, a, a system administrator who had messed up a firewall connection. But once again, yeah, we missed that. It was the customers who were calling in and complaining, or well, they're complaining on social media. And yeah, preemptive support automations is an attempt to predict disruption and act on them. And the second reason you know, to collect all these metrics is things will go wrong. You're dealing with software. You will get a crash. You, yeah, and you don't, you know, you want to reduce the time you spend troubleshooting what went wrong, and you want to make sure that, you know, these crashes never happen again, that you put in the early warning signs. And, you know, doing post-mortem debugging, if you don't have a snapshot of the system, is lo like looking for a needle in a, in a haystack, and it is looking for, like, you know, looking for a needle in a haystack, even if you have a snapshot of the system. So, you know, I was lucky with my SMS. It took me one to one and a half minutes to figure it out. Had I not had that visibility, you know, I would have just admitted guilt, say, yeah, there's a problem here, we have no idea what it is, but you know, we'll raise a ticket and look into it. Yeah, and that would have you know, really wasted hours and hours and hours, if not days. So remember, you know, pretend this is your colleague who gets woken up in the middle of the night to address an issue you have caused. And not only you know, is he your colleague, he knows where you live. <laughs> so don't give them the excuse to visit. Uh, you know, provide them with the necessary visibility which allows them to isolate and address the issue. And this visibility needs to be planned in as part of your requirements. You need to start thinking about it in the design phase and development phase of the system. It is not something you can add in as an afterthought. Yeah. Any questions? No questions. So, yes. Oh, it happens all the time. Um, I think one of the most recent ones was um, it was an instant messaging system for a huge uh, social network. And they went in and upgraded the security on, on, the, on, on their apps. So uh, the mobile devices, they basically enabled the security, enabled encryption. And all of a sudden, you know, as users went in and uh, upgraded their apps, we started seeing a huge degradation of of, 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 you know, of the performance, a huge, massive degradation. And we actually you know, ended up you know, f you know, realizing, okay, they've enabled the security, but once again, we, it, was it was really hard to figure out what was causing the lock contention in the VM. And we figured, uh, you, know, you understand that you know, it usually has to do with lock contention when you can't find anything in, in your regular business metrics. And there's actually a flag which when you compile the Erlang VM, which you can set, which hits performance, but every time there's a lock, it will give you all of that information to you. And it took us about two weeks to go in and figure that one out, uh, to figure out, you know, to recompile and deploy in the live scenario, because it was really hard to recreate also in, in, in a test lab, redeploy one node with, um, with, uh, you know, with, with the Erlang VM, uh, with the Erlang VM, um, you know, compiled with this flag on. And immediately we started seeing that the decryption module, which we used, put, a, put in place a global lock. So the encryption module, the, the device driver, the NIF we were using, had been compiled with a flag which only allows one decryption at a time. And, uh, yeah, so, you know, it, 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 it's, you know, these are the types of challenges we see on a day-to-day -day basis. Other ones include, uh, well, multi-core, and you know, looking at uh, non-uniform memory access on multi-core and you know, bugs in the VM which are related to those. Yes? Yes, there's no one size fits all. Yeah, but I use Nagios you know, as an example for alarming and threshold-based alarms, but it's our customers will use absolutely everything. Uh, 
It depends, no. So the log throughput I was talking about, um, all we did is uh, we created files, which you know, we rotated every hour, and, uh, and then you know, stored offline. Now this was, yeah, so I think, and that's usually the easiest way because you get, you know, you, you tend to use drivers, you, 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 know, you write you know, your code in C, and, uh, and you, you end up getting that level of throughput. And then, you know, it, it just completely depends. You know, you wouldn't, yeah, that might work. You know, in some cases, it might not. Uh, the particular example I gave you, I use grep. But all, all, all of those, you know, to, 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 to quickly navigate through them, in some cases, you might want to push them to a database as well. You know. Any other questions? No? Um, there is, you know, a bit of suggested reading. One, if you go to the Erlang Solutions blog, we have uh, a few blog posts on uh, RabbitMQ and operations. So if you do use RabbitMQ, I really warmly recommend it. And there was one blog post I wrote out of pure frustration um, when uh, you know, I was trying to explain you know, how to do monitoring to someone straight out of university. And they replied, oh, I can do it. It's only Erlang code. And so I basically yeah, ended up writing an email back saying, yes, it is only Erlang code, but dot, dot, dot. And, uh, and we ended up turning it into a blog post. It's called you know, DevOps from the Trenches, which I warmly recommend. And there's also, you know, for those of you who have Designing for Scalability, which is the, book, the, the last book I wrote for O'Reilly, the last chapter in that book covers all of this yeah, in detail. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'll be around, so feel free to ask.